what I was going to tell you about today is really just an overview of the things we've been doing on simulation and how it relates to neuronal development, uh, neuron function, and particularly neurodegeneration. Um, and might uh, cover a bunch of things, so it's, it's a, more of an overview than anything. And um, so unlike ubiquitin, which is the famous counterpart of simulation, uh, there hasn't been that much done until recently on sumo modifications uh, for reasons I'm not quite sure. Um, but it's very similar to ubiquitin, uh, in some ways just actually less complex. So there's three different um, sumo isoforms, uh, one, two, and three. They're structurally very similar. Uh, sequence divergence uh, between sumo 1 and 2, 3 is about 50 percent. Sumo 2 and 3 are virtually identical. Their difference is only five residues. Um, they uh, are unique because they can form the polysumo chains, similar to polyubiquitin, um, and they all have this diaglycine motif, which is the activating motif at the C terminus. And in terms of uh, functions, they are best known for cancer, biology, tumorigenesis because they regulate uh, transcription uh, factors. They also do protein-protein interactions uh, and different shuttling to compartments of the cells and also protein uh, stability and solubility. So anybody working with recombinant proteins might have used the sumo construct to increase the solubility. That's actually the yeast uh, sumo, which is quite different, uh, because these two classes of human uh, sumos behave quite differently, which I, I hope I can convince you. Similar to ubiquitin, it goes through this recycling process, um, but again, very much uh, less in terms of complexity than ubiquitination. So the sumos get activated by the cleavage at the C terminus by a protease, a group of proteases called SENPs. Once it's cleaved, uh, it gets activated by the E1, and then uh, which there's only two. Um, and then the big gatekeeper is the E2 ligase. So in ubiquitination, there's multiple, uh, more than 100 probably, E2 ligases. And in simulation, there's one, UBC9. So that is the one that esterifies and then transfers it to the E3 ligases. And the E3s are the ones that confer target specificity. So individual proteins get um, simulated uh, by uh, these particular ligases who select their targets. Once the target is uh, simulated, it changes its function or changes its solubility, and then it can be recycled again by the same proteases, it's these SENPs, and the sequence can go round and round. So uh, people in neurodegeneration, when we started looking at this, uh, were really focused on ubiquitination, um, and uh, simulation really didn't have much of a airtime or function, and particularly in, in neurons. Uh, they did in cancer, but neurobiology almost nothing. And then we got interested in this with a paper that came out uh, 13, 14 years ago, where this myocyte enhancing factor, which is a transcriptional uh, factor, could be simulated or phosphorylated, and there's a big uh, connection between those. So proteins that can get simulated Often there's an uh, interplay between phosphorylation and simulation, similar to ubiquitination. And when this is simulated or phosphorylated, um, the transcription is off. You get a lot of dendritic arborization. When it's switched to an acetyl uh, group, you, then you uh, shut down that process. So the neurodevelopment uh, can be um, you know, very intimately controlled by one simulation of one protein. So uh, we wanted to start looking at this in vivo, and we built a lot of animal models. So the first thing we did was uh, start looking at uh, creation of, of overexpressing transgenes is usually the first step. 
And in this, we use the humans, uh, humans SUMO1, and SUMO1 was picked because the most information was available on it, again, mostly uh, with respect to cancer. And we used uh, our typical expression vector, which is a big chunk of genomic DNA with uh, prion costet vector, which has great integration and really high copy numbers. And the prion uh, protein uh, promoter is a neuronal housekeeping gene, so it's almost exclusively neuronal. From that, we got two uh, founder lines, different levels of expression. This is the sumo monomer. These are the sumo conjugates, so you get these smear of high molecular weight uh, uh, modified proteins. And we found that this was uh, expressed throughout the brain, uh, hippocampus, cerebellum, cortex, olfactory bulb, um, actually very high in olfactory bulb where surprisingly it's a, you get a lot of pathology in Alzheimer's disease. And this work was done by uh, a visiting scientist from Osaka, Shinsuke Matsuzaki. And the really surprising thing about this was the increased stimulation because we thought that the UVC9 would be the rate limiting step so you could only get enough conjugation, depending on how much UVC9 was there to, to um, control it. But in fact, it seems that UVC9 can handle as much sumo as you can give it, and it um, uh, over-conjugates uh, these proteins. So we took um, whole brain homogenates from these animals, did a very large-scale proteomic study uh, with a group in uh, Toronto who uh, by coincidence, uh, came from Lee Hood's lab, uh, a guy named Brian, Brian Rout, who uh, worked on simulation proteomics in um, chromatin remodeling. So he was a great resource, and Brian's lab uh, uh, helped us with the uh, analyzing the um, pull downs. And we got about 90 very high confidence level proteins that were simulated in different classes. Uh, that Expected ones such as nuclear and kinases and proteases and some signaling were known, uh, but there were a lot of unknown proteins as well that hadn't been um, identified as simulation, some which were frankly unknown. But the ones that we were more interested in in terms of brain, um, the first class was the vesicular and trafficking proteins. So there were a number of those, uh, I'm sure some of you recognize them with uh, fairly high confidence, synaptotagmin, both of the synapsins, uh, one and two, and a collection of, of vesicular uh, synaptic vesicle proteins. So what happens to these if they get simulated? Well, I'm sure uh, you've seen or are familiar with synaptotagmin. It's a calcium-regulated uh, or regulator of synaptic fusion along with synapsins and synaptic brevin, um, which then really is the complex that causes the or facilitates neurotransmission. And we validated a bunch of these proteins that came down in the proteomics. This is just an example for synaptotagmin. So if we immunoprecipitate with uh, synaptotagmin and then you reprobe with sumo, you can see this is the sumulated band in the TGs. In really overexpressed Western blots for just synaptotagmin, uh, you can see that, in fact, it seems that the even the endogenous protein is simulated. Now, the outcome of simulation of synaptotagmin and other synaptic proteins seem to be largely negative. So, with a collaborator at Columbia University, uh, Ottavio Arancio, we looked at the electrophysiology. Uh, paired pulse facilitation is a measure of synaptic plasticity and general synaptic function, and you can see it's significantly reduced in the transgenes. And basal synaptic transmission, which is sort of a measure of LTP uh, in these uh, particular animals, was very impaired. So that the uh, simulation of things like uh, synaptotagmin and the synapsins, synap syntaxins um, seem to downregulate synaptic transmission and synaptic function. So it, it, it seems to be a negative regulator of, uh, of, the, of those functions. The other ones that we were very interested in were cytoskeletal, uh, both um, uh, involved in neurite outgrowth and um, dendritic spine st stability. 
And there had been some precedent in the past for these in terms of subulation linked to cytoskeleton. And the first one was in um, C. elegans, uh, where it has one sumulation factor, SMO1. Knocking it out, you can see, has a very dramatic effect on um, intermediate filaments, so that the integrity of their uh, assembly is completely lost. And these things just, uh, these animals uh, have virtually no inter intermediate filament um, architecture. So we looked at um, the consequences of, of what might happen in, in the uh, overexpressing mice. And the first thing it was noticed was that the dendritic spine density was severely reduced in uh, transgenes as compared to wild type. These are from pyramidal, cortical, and uh, hippocampal neurons. You can see them blown up here. Uh, not only the number of change, but the uh, morphology, particularly the longer spines, um, seem to be reduced uh, more, more uh, specifically than, than others. So, and this is just a quantification of them. Uh, it's down probably 30 to 30% 30 of the uh, wild type. And it doesn't happen just in a specific area. Uh, the entire, if you look at it, all the way down in the pyramidal neurons, the spine counts uh, decrease, uh, are decreased uh, across the board. So the synaptic um, transmission failure is also age-related. So as these animals um, get older, the condition gets worse. Uh, this is comparing the synaptic transmission of uh, four to six to nine to 10 months, and you can see it's a progressive uh, decline. The combination of all of these uh, in these SUMO1 mice is um, severe cognitive impairment. So the loss of genetic spines, uh, the failure of normal synaptic transmission uh, uh, makes them uh, really poor in terms of learning and memory. And this is done by, uh, this is contextual fear conditioning. They get a small foot shock. They look at what the freezing rate is. And you can see in the contextual, it's, it's quite reduced. And this is mostly hippocampal plus amygdala uh, learning and memory. Um, and then in the acute, it's not so significant. And that's primarily amygdala driven. So it's, it's the changes that we see are very specific to, uh, to the hippocampus. Uh, we went to look for mechanisms of not only the cognition problems, but the uh, underlying um, factors that, that reduce the synaptic density. And again, going back to the cytoskeletal proteins uh, from the proteomics, some of these you might uh, recognize, fMR1, uh, CAM kinase, um, and also the microtubule associated tau protein. And if we look at these, uh, and they're very high confidence levels in terms of simulation levels, and these functionally are involved in exonal outgrowth, uh, particularly related to um, actin remodeling. This one, GIT, the GPCR kinase interactor one, uh, GIT one, um, but also uh, related to the ARP23 complex. Uh, so there's many of these that came out are, are good candidates for um, the changes in spine density. Um, and particularly this one which we validated, uh, GIT1, uh, which is involved in uh, efferent signaling and track, um, track B, uh, along with the um, protein interactors kinase C, PIC1, these regulate spine maturation and spine uh, uh, synapse formation. And you can see in the loss of function, knockouts, you get the similar phenotype to what you get in overexpressing sumo uh, mice. So that these are uh, indicative of a loss of function for these simulated proteins, both uh, synaptotagmin and the ones that regulate dendritic spine formation. So that. The basic neurobiology, very quick characterization of these mice and what happens to them and what the outcomes are, uh, that's really not 
our major objective. Uh, uh, it's interesting to see that Sumo does things to uh, synaptic development and function. But our institute is really focused on neurodegeneration. And um, we uh, got into this simulation business mostly because of what we saw in, or what people saw in, in Huntington's and a lot of the uh, uh, ataxia disorders. So that these um, underlying proteins, Huntington's, ataxin, are all simulated. And the inclusion bodies that you see in those are also simulated, suggesting that there's some connection. And there had been prior uh, models, particularly in Drosophila, that showed that uh, simulation of Huntington exacerbated the, um, the uh, phenotype of the disease. Our primary goals as an institute are, are uh, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, uh, also prion diseases, and ALS. Um, my focus is largely on these two, AD and PD. Uh, and the major players are uh, the amyloid precursor protein, tau, synuclein, DJ1, um, also seen in related movement disorder diseases. And there's also simulation of inclusion bodies in, in uh, neurological disorders that uh, we don't know the underlying protein. So those are still of interest. Um, but we, again, focused on the uh, main players in Alzheimer's disease. And for those of you who uh, don't work on Alzheimer's, just a quick review of, of what the main uh, factors are. So Alzheimer's is, can be genetic, can be environmental. Uh, there are some very uh, familial disorders through presenilin mutations, which we found uh, back in 2005. And this is actually a patient with a presenilin mutation. But this leads to the accumulation of amyloid proteins either in the neuropil, surrounded by dystrophic neurons, neurons and uh, also in the vascular system. And it's considered that this amyloid accumulation triggers an intracellular signaling <coughs> process leading to the accumulation of the tau protein as neurofibrillary tangles. This is the main cause of uh, neuronal death and that manifests itself as the clinical signs of uh, dementia, memory loss, behavioral changes. And the focus for simulation was on these intermediate pathways, the main causes. Um, tau is a member of the natively unfolded uh, group of proteins. Um, it's got four microtubule binding repeats. It's got a number of mutations that are associated with frontal temporal dementia. Um, and uh, in solution, this protein is largely unfolded, no really native structure. Similar for synuclein, it's got uh, a couple of mutations associated with familial Parkinson's disease. Tau forms neurofibrillary tangles, interneurons, and um, synuclein uh, assembles into the Lewy bodies. And the simulation project in the lab really started with a student, Bernie Duval, who came uh, in one day and said she wanted to work on simulation and Alzheimer's disease. Uh, so she caught my attention. And she was the first one to show that actually sumo, uh, tau and synuclein were simulated using an a overexpression system in cells, nickel uh, affinity chromatography to pull down all the simulated proteins. And you can see that uh, tau is simulated primarily by SUMO1 and also synuclein and a lesser extent to um, SUMO2 uh, and 3. And Veronique also showed that there's two consensus sequences for uh, simulation in tau, one within the microtubule repeat, the fourth one, and the other one just C-terminal to that. And mutation analysis showed that the simulation was exclusively within the fourth microtubule binding repeat, which uh, likely alters its function due to a, a lot of steric uh, hindrance issues. Because what tau normally does is uh, the microtubule repeats, whether they're three or four, depending on which uh, splice isoform you have, bind to uh, tubulin. Uh, stabilize microtubules, allow normal anterior grade and retrograde transport, and also drive axon formation. 
Um, but when they become phosphorylated, they generally dissociate from uh, the microtubules. And when they become hyperphosphorylated, they aggregate and assemble into um, these neurofibrillary tangles or paratelical filaments, which then lead to neuronal death. And what we found was that uh, increasing the phosphorylation by decreasing phosphatase activity, increased stimulation, or if you use microtubule disruptors like colchicine, you freed off the uh, tau, and it became more heavily stimulated, indicating that uh, the modification is primarily to the free floating form of, uh, of uh, tau. So these were all done in vitro, which you always worry about you overexpressing two proteins and getting an effect and whether or not it happens uh, in vivo. Um, but we also, as I mentioned, found in our SUMO1 transgenes that uh, it was uh, being modified in vivo to a large extent. And the project was taken over by a uh, postdoc who joined us from uh, Japan, Hironori uh, Takamura. And so what Hiro did was he started looking at different tauopathies. Is there really a connection between sumo-1 and sumulation generally and disease? And what he found was that in progressive supranuclear palsy, which is a, a starts out as a movement disorder and later becomes a, a dementing, uh, disease, and it's unique because it's uh, you find uh, uh, tau accumulations in oligodendrocytes. They call them, uh, and they also in astrocytes. They're tufted astrocytes as well as in neurons. And what this is is um, uh, staining for sumo one, co-localizing with these accumulations. But in PSP, we saw no uh, SUMO2 accumulation with the, uh, or co-localization with the tau positive aggregates, suggesting that sumulation was really happening in these PSP cases. To prove it was, uh, the aggregates were isolated using a fairly standard detergent uh, uh, sarcosyl extraction process uh, and isolated um, and shown here in negative stain EM. And once solubilized, uh, what Hiro found was that um, if you did a Western with tau after a sumo 1 IP, you could find this higher molecular weight band was tau, the simulated form of tau. But the unique thing about this is that it's a very truncated form. So if we run a control full length tau, it usually runs at about 70 kD, but these were running at about 50. And in fact, the major band was even smaller. So this was the unsumulated tau, and this is the simulated tau. And this isn't um, unknown in PSP. Um, other people have found that uh, it has this unique truncation uh, vector, or truncation form. Um, that runs uh, much smaller than what we see for full length, and it's not seen in other um, tauopathies like FTD or cortical basal degeneration. And it seems that this truncation uh, combined with simulation um, is um, a major factor in the PSP uh, case. So that using uh, Fusion proteins to mimic our model simulation. If you use the uh, full-length protein, it seems to be it's you know quite happy. Uh, whether it's sumo one modified or sumo two, if you take the truncated one to chop off the first 150 residues, you get this just primarily the microtubule binding repeats. When it's simulated um, by SUMO1, you get this reticular staining, so it starts to accumulate and aggregate within the cells. But the truncated by itself or the truncated SUMO2, you get really no effect. So there seems to be a connection um, with uh, PSP and simulation and certain changes in tau biology that uh, can uh, promote disease.
I'll get back to that in a minute, but the other uh, factor was APP. So the amyloid precursor protein, as it states, is the progenitor of the amyloid beta peptide, so you get a beta secretase or a gamma secretase cleavage. The small peptide's released, it aggregates, and it becomes amyloid. But there's two consensus lysines for simulation close to the beta secretase uh, cleavage site. And people have suggested that um, the simulation can alter amyloid generation. So in this case, the, uh, Kevin Sarge's group was the first to show that if you uh, co-express uh, UBC9, SUMO1, and APP, you can get a uh, simulated form of the APP uh, precursor. And what they suggested was that uh, non-simulated had a much more higher production of A-beta than simulated form. And this was shown here in this western blot of, of ladders of, of uh, A-beta peptide, that the intensity decreased. Now this was um, uh, controversial. A lot of people got different results. Uh, some were positive and negative. Um, some showed that a simulation increased autophagy. Um, others showed that um, the beta secretase, or base, when simulated, uh, increased in stability and caused more amyloid production and exacerbated the Alzheimer's uh, phenotype. Um, and so there was a lot of, you know, people who thought, yes, Simulation and APP have some connection. A lot of people thought, no, it's just an artifact of cellular uh, overexpression. And so we wanted to look at it again, mostly in vivo, to try and reduce that uh, problem. And uh, we crossed our SUMO1 mice with our uh, standard APP model. This is called TGCRND8 where, again, we used the prion uh, costed vector and expressed the mutant APP, which had what's called Swedish and Indiana mutations. So these are ones that increase the production of uh, the A-beta peptide, but also a longer, more aggregation amyloidogenic form. And these mice have been really, these CRND8s have been really useful because um, you can get a phenotype within about three to four months of very high uh, pathology uh, content of amyloid uh, deposition, but also you get uh, things like tau phosphorylation, cerebrovascular amyloid, uh, neurofilament changes, um, and a lot of synaptic toxic toxicity leading to um, cognitive impairments, so these animals are, are quite severely impaired. But also, interestingly, the, uh, although the, it's expressed throughout the brain, you get the same localization of pathology in the olfactory bulb, cortex, and hippocampus, whereas the hindbrain, the cerebellum, is, is unaffected in these mice. But again, the advantage of them is it's really rapid, so we can um, turn them over. And actually, this, this mouse is, is licensed to Merck for uh, uh, industrial purposes. So the cross, um, again, to make a long story short, Aaron Nock, who worked in the lab, uh, came from Cambridge, uh, now in the stem cell uh, biotech uh, world. She found that the cross um, increased the uh, pathology, uh, so SUMO1 would elevate the aggregation, accumulation pathology of the um, A-beta peptide. This is quantified here in the cortex and hippocampus, uh, dense and diffuse. Dense is the internal core, and the diffuse is the halo around the amyloid plaque. Um, and the outcome of this was um, an impairment in LTP. So these animals are relatively young. So the, I showed you that this increased uh, expression of SUMO caused the uh, cognitive impairments. 
again, it, it was much later in life. So these younger ones are not as impaired as the older ones. It's just the sumo two by them, sumo one by themselves. But if you, um, this is the APP mice, so obviously LTP impairments. And when you have the uh, sumo one APP, you exacerbate that um, pathology. And this is also seen in cognitive impairments. Again, contextual, the sumo one shows some um, impairments already, just simply because of the dendritic spine loss and synaptic transmission problems. Um, but it, it gets progressively worse in, when you overlay the SUMO1 and the APP. But the important, uh, the interesting one was this cube, which as I told you was mostly amygdala. So in the SUMO1 mice, these are much more spared than um, uh, even though they've lost a lot of uh, neural development. Um, but um, when you start adding pathology, so these mice get um, uh, amyloid deposition in the uh, amygdala, so that when you overlay the pathology with the SUMO1 protein, it just gets significantly worse. So uh, we weren't really quite sure what SUMO1 was, uh, SUMO was going to do, but it turned out that everything it did was mostly bad. Uh, so it, your, the synapses didn't work. There were a lot fewer of them. Uh, it uh, can simulate tau, and under certain circumstances, make the tau pathology worse. And APP, same thing, increases the APP pathology. Um, and I should say, this isn't due to a, an elevation in the amount of A beta that's being produced because we looked at uh, fragments of the APP protein, they were the same in both mice. There were really no big differences in terms of processing. It seems this is a clearance problem. And what I didn't go into was that actually the inflammatory responses in these mice is, uh, are very much reduced. Um, so that it's not a problem of producing more amyloid, it's a problem of getting rid of it. But either way, uh, SUMO makes it worse. Uh, SUMO 1, I should say, makes it worse. Uh, but SUMO isn't all bad. Um, when we were really getting into this um, in terms of pathology, uh, Otavio's lab um, was coming at it from a different direction, uh, and it turned out that it's one of these very small world coincidences <laughs> because um, a PhD student in my lab uh, was recruited as, after a postdoc as junior faculty at Columbia in the same institute as Otavio and found out that Otavio was working on SUMO and we were working on SUMO so we made the connection and now uh, two R01 grants later we're still uh, working together so something must be going right. But Outside of that story, um, Otavio's lab uh, was interested in basic neurobiology. I mean, he's an electrophysiologist, learning and memory. And what they found was what they uh, stimulated hippocampal slices, either tetanus or potassium chloride, to invoke an LTP. They saw a very specific increase in SUMO2. Uh, well, I'll just call it SUMO2. SUMO2, 3 are pretty much interchangeable. Um, but no change in SUMO1. As you can see quantitatively here, it's obvious the difference. Um, Otavio also works in uh, the Alzheimer's world, and uh, when they added amyloid beta to these hippocampal slices, you lose this increase in SUMO2, suggesting that one potential link to the mechanism of A beta is not just general synaptic toxicity, but an impairment in simulation that's necessary for a normal LTP. So we kind of got together and, and worked at it from the same angle and um, found that, um, that simulation is actually an essential uh, feature in LTP. So uh, using a dominant negative um, UBC9, so using the TAT, 
uh, just to get entry into the neurons in these hippocampal slices. And the dominant negative uh, shuts down these, yeah, the E2 ligases uh, and effectively eliminates sumulation. And you can see LTP is lost, nothing with GFP. And if you use the TAT uh, UVC9, you just maintain the same LTP. Again, graphically here. Similarly, if you use the SEN-P, and this is a, a, a protease dead mutant um, uh, that has no ability to uh, desumulate. Uh, but if you increase the SEN-P1, which clips off sumo from various proteins, you also lose LTP. So whether you decrease sumulation or increase desumulation, you get an impairment in LTP. And this um, could also rescue um, the A-beta-induced LTP phenotype. So uh, in this case, you take hippocampal slices, you add A-beta, you lose the sumo-2 conjugation, if you um, then add in the, the, as I said, the UBC9 by itself doesn't have much effect, but if you have the combination of the two, you can actually restore simulation and at the same time restore um, LTP. So this is A beta, loss of LTP or impairment of LTP. A beta plus the increased simulation, you're back to normal LTP. This is an exogenous A-beta, so you take a slice, you add synthetic purified A-beta oligomers to it. This is a slice from one of our um, APP uh, transgenes, so it's producing its own A-beta, and you get the same effect, whether it's exogenous or endogenous um, A-beta. Again, so vehicle, you get impairment, and if you increase with the um, UBC9, you can completely revert that phenotype. So these mice, cognitively, you would expect to be perfectly normal. So based on that information, we made SUMO2 uh, overexpressing transgenes, thinking that we might actually create smarter mice because uh, you would expect so again, using the same prion costet, neuronal expression exclusively, we got two different lines. Um, these are non-transgenic. These are ones that were effectively heterozygote and then ones that were back crossed to, to get uh, effectively homozygote mice. And you can see the progressive increase in expression. The interesting thing about these guys is that you can see there's no endogenous or no basal uh, increase in the sumulation, um, higher molecular weight sumulated proteins. We do get an, an enhancement in the um, synaptosomes. So if we take these mice, do a normal synaptosome prep, there's a lot of sumo getting trafficked to the synaptosomes. Um, so if you go back to what we saw here, if you increase the uh, simulation, uh, particularly of SUMO2, you get a normal LTP. So we thought these might actually have an enhanced LTP. Uh, sadly, that wasn't the case. Uh, oh, actually, I won't show that. I'll, I'll just tell you that they didn't show differences in LTP. They didn't show differences in behavior. So this is radial arm water maze, stick of mouse in the middle. It's got eight different arms it can go to, and it learns which one has the reward in it. Um, and over a course of a day of different trials, they start to learn. And then when you come back the next day, they remember uh, what they did. Um, same for any of the fear conditioning. So these guys express tons of synaptic SUMO2, but they're not actually um, super brilliant more than a normal mouse. Um, but if we go back to what um, was found with the slices, if we add a beta, or if we add, uh, uh, use the APP transgene, then um, 
you can um, rescue the Alzheimer's like cognitive impairment, LTP impairment, phenotype. So we crossed um, the SUMO2 overexpressing with our very aggressive uh, APP transgenic model. And these mice we let to go to six months of age. So you can see that the amount of pathology in these animals is massive. Um, the hippocampus, cortex, amygdala are just absolutely packed full of um, amyloid plaques, but not only amyloid, amyloid aggregates as plaques, but the soluble oligomers, which are thought to be the really toxic species in terms of um, in terms of synaptic toxicity. And you can see, again, that the APP mice by themselves are impaired. They don't learn. They don't remember the second day in the radial arm wire maze. The wild type and the SUMO2, which I showed you already, are perfectly normal. But if we do the, the SUMO2 crossed with these mice that have really a, a head full of amyloid, which um, normally just incapacitates these animals. Um, they are perfectly normal. So they can learn, they can remember. Uh, it's like they have no amyloid at all. This is the same in um, the contextual and cute. Um, and as I said, this should be, this is unpublished data. Um, so you give them their baseline, they learn, you give them a little foot shock, uh, come back and you either give them a context, so like a smell, or you give them a cue, and you measure freezing, and you can see that the wild types respond well, and the SUMO2 respond well. The APP is severely impaired, not unexpectedly, but you cannot tell the difference between the APP mice overexpressing SUMO2 in either of these uh, contextual or cued responses. It's almost like they just don't care that amyloid is there. It has no effect. Um, and again, we can see this in LTP. So uh, APP impaired, uh, much like the slices, but this is like a, a, a real animal. SUMO2, not much difference. And again, non-transgenic and transgenic. So for us, this was um, really interesting, not only from a sort of biological disease mechanism uh, perspective, but also from that of a, a drug development. So there's been tons of money poured into amyloid, anti-amyloid drugs, whether it's beta secretase inhibitors, gamma secretase, which failed spectacularly in clinical trials. Um, there's tons of, of immunotherapies. Uh, one, uh, well, some that have failed. One, a recent one between Biogen and Asai, the Japanese group, uh, was just revived after what they thought was a phase three clinical uh, trial failure. They've now said, actually, the results are not so bad and we're gonna bring this back and reevaluate it, and their stock went through the, through the sky. But all of those uh, typically have failed, and what, whether they're intended to reduce the amount of amyloid or get rid of the stuff that's already there, um, but they don't work that well uh, so far. So what intrigued us about this is that the sumo doesn't really care. You can have amyloid there, but it, you can, and I won't go into it, but the, the mechanism seem to be that it stabilizes uh, and maintains synapses even in the presence of, of uh, a lot of amyloid. Um, so we hooked up with um, a group, uh, as I, I told you, this is my, Otavio, Luana, Fioriti. So Luana uh, is also at New York, um, at Columbia, um, working with Eric Kandel's group. Uh, 
She's now uh, founded a, a biotech company in New York and splits her time between New York, uh, uh, Long Island, and uh, Mario Negri. In, she has a position in, in Milan as well. And so with, um, uh, and we had worked together with the Candel Group on, on a couple of simulation projects related to RNA binding proteins. Uh, And so Luana took this um, idea of sumo as a drug or a druggable target um, and came up with a sumo 2 mimetic, um, which is actually a, a biologic, not a small molecule. And um, it's called PLB002. And this is a, a PK bioavailability study with a labeled compound either injected IV or through an intranasal administration and you can see that it has very good brain uh, penetration and um, introducing them into cells or into the brain you can see that increases the simulation uh, of endogenous proteins and uh, this compound this biologic tested in uh, slices with Otavio's group showed that um, in the presence of A-beta, you get uh, the impairment of LTP, but A-beta plus PLB002 could mimic the same phenotype as the overexpression or genetic uh, increases of um, SUMO2 in these in the mice so this compound we just um, between Loana Otavio and myself uh, I got a foundation um, an award from a, a foundation to take this to preclinical testing um, for a beta and also the other implication was with tau so as I said um, sumo one seems to be very detrimental to tau pathology uh, and neuronal function. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, SUMO2, uh, either as a, this mimetic or as the SUMO2 overexpression, uh, has an effect on tau as well, similar. These are very initial unpublished studies, uh, obviously, uh, in tau transgenics that, um, or the, uh, uh, the FTD mutants. Um, who have impaired either adding tau oligomers or looking at the slices themselves. You can see, but this can be reversed by PLB002 or uh, using a negative control to show specificity. So another very similar sumo um, biologic that has no activity, uh, had no effect. So we're really, uh, I think, pretty excited about um, moving this through to clinical trials, um, also doing some basic biology on the side in the simulation, um, and we'll have to see where it goes. And with that, I think I mentioned the people who really did all the work and the funding. So with that, thank you very much.